tonight, a major blow to Canadian meat producers. Amid a diplomatic clash, China considers a complete ban of all Canadian meat products. We'll take you through this development story. Lack of sleep, food, and sanitation. They were hungry, they were tired. International outcry as migrant children are moved back to a Texas detention center. Plus, Paul Hunter at the U.S.-Mexico border. It's all belly crawl, um, they're all very small. The secret, dangerous world of human smuggling. Just fell back from the sky. Gravity is not my friend. <laughs> And his record-breaking space flight is over, but will other Canadian astronauts be charting a very different path? This is The National. The showdown between Canada and China is escalating tonight, and a huge cross-section of Canadian farmers will pay the price. China is considering shutting out all meat products from this country. China is the world's largest consumer of pork. Canada is the world's third largest producer, shipping half a billion dollars worth of pork products to China last year. So what should we make of China's sudden suspension? Well, Power and Politics host Vashi Capellos has more. Ahead of this week's meeting of world leaders in Japan, officials in Beijing were talking free trade high on the agenda of the Chinese delegation. But this afternoon, word that China is blocking a major Canadian import, meat, it says, for safety concerns. Canadian officials confirm they recently found that veterinary health certificates for some pork and beef products were faked. A Chinese embassy spokesperson wrote to CBC News saying, in order to protect the safety of Chinese consumers, China has taken urgent preventive measures and requested the Canadian government suspend the issuance of certificates for meat exported to China. The feds insist they're working on it. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency has taken measures to address this issue and is continuing to work closely with industry partners and Chinese officials, a statement from the government reads. The fact that, let's say, one firm may have been using fake quarantine certificates or fake um, inspection certificates. That is what has led, I believe, to the threat to stop all meat, meat exports. And that's big business for our country. But this is just the latest provocation from China following the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou on Canadian soil back in December. Since then, China has banned imports from two of Canada's biggest canola distributors, affecting a $5 billion industry. And there's the two Canadians, Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrig, both detained following Meng's arrest. They're still being held with no formal charges against them. We have been engaging in uh, multiple efforts uh, with the Chinese, with uh, our allies around the world, uh, to try and bring these Canadians home. Those We're efforts so far, though, have failed. Doing... Neither the prime minister or the foreign minister can even get their counterpart on the phone, which is why this week's summit in Japan is so vital. Okay, so Vashi, tell us more about how vital this summit in Japan would be, uh, what we should be looking out for. Look, Andrew, this is the prime minister's chance to actually talk to the president of China, to President Xi. Every call that he's tried to make, every request that's been put out or the foreign affairs minister has put out, we know now has been completely ignored. Their calls have gone unheeded. They have literally not been able to get a hold of anyone in China. This is the prime minister's chance, if maybe President Trump facilitates it, to actually sit down in front of President Xi and plead his case. It's a long shot. We don't know if it'll happen, but this is the only opportunity to do so. Right, and, but even if he is able to, to get that chance and to, to wave down the Chinese president, then what? I mean, there are no guarantees, right? No, there are none, and that's the big problem here, because let's say the Prime Minister pleads Canada's case and says, hey, we didn't have a choice in arresting Meng Wanzhou. We had an extradition treaty with the U.S. Well, we already know the Chinese government doesn't work that way. They don't believe that. They think that Canada and the federal government should be able to intervene politically and just drop this case. And so where we're left at, even if this meeting happens, is likely the Chinese, until the Meng Wanzhou case is completely dropped, will not drop their uh, aggressive actions against Canada either. Okay, the host of CBC News Network's Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos in Ottawa. Thanks so much, Vashi. So can Ottawa's fractured relationship with Beijing be repaired this week at the G20 summit? Well, one person who has an idea of how is John McCallum, 
Uh, you'll recall he was booted from his job as Canada's ambassador to China earlier this year. And that post has been vacant ever since. Well, today, McCallum spoke to our Hannah Thibodeau from Beijing. John McCallum says a quick fix for the rocky relationship between China and Canada would come from the U.S. president. Well, I certainly hope that he can help. Anything I can do to help Canada, I will be doing. Donald Trump said he'd do just that. Last week, telling Prime Minister Justin Trudeau he'd bring up the issue of the Canadians jailed in China. The arrests are an apparent retaliation of Canada's arrest of Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver last December at the U.S.'s request. I think from the point of view of restoring relations and releasing our hostages, the best thing that Trump could do would be to say that he's no longer seeking to extradite uh, Meng Wanzhou. Now, I doubt that he will say that. He could ask Xi to release our hostages. Uh, I don't know what Mr. Trump is going to do. He's a difficult person to predict. This isn't the first time McCallum has said the case against Meng should be dropped. I think uh, she has quite good arguments on her side. After that, uh, Trudeau asked for McCallum's resignation. Since then, Canada has been without an ambassador in China, and the situation has gotten worse. The Chinese leadership has not wanted to speak to us. Uh, ideally, it would be better if our people could speak to their people, but they, for the time being, are not wanting to speak to us. McCallum is in Beijing for the next few weeks, but this time he's working for the private sector. But he did have a chance to speak with his former colleagues at the Canadian Embassy. They say they're continuing to visit the two men more than once a month, and they're holding up as well as can be expected. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, Adrian, let's move now to the U.S.'s southern border. Indeed, because there has been an outcry over conditions at a Texas detention center for migrant children, what one doctor who witnessed them described as torture. Kim Brunhuber spoke tonight with a lawyer who also visited the facility. He has the latest from the U.S.-Mexico border as officials struggle and the children suffer. Children sleeping on concrete floors. Eight-year-olds forced to care for a two-year-old they just met children who hadn't bathed since they crossed the border weeks earlier. No cameras were allowed inside, but those were conditions described by the children detained at this border patrol station in Clint, Texas. You were among the lawyers who interviewed some 60 or so children there. What did you see? We could not believe just how, their, how dirty their clothes were, how stained, how they, some of them smelled. They were hungry, they were tired, they were emotional, they were crying. Officials dispute some of the details. Close to 300 children at the troubled facility were initially transferred elsewhere, but today border officials say more than 100 have been sent back. Now the acting chief of U.S. Customs and Border Protection is resigning from a job he's held for less than two months. There's also paralysis in Washington. Congress is divided over a bill that would send $4.5 billion in emergency humanitarian aid to the border. Some Democrats fear the extra money will be used to fund aggressive enforcement, including deportation raids promised by Donald Trump. We do need to make sure it's not going to be used for ICE or internal enforcement or things like that. Republicans, meanwhile, oppose provisions in the bill that would restrict border enforcement. It's been Democrats who've been denying that there's a crisis at our border. It's been Democrats who've been denying us the resources and reforms to end that crisis. Activists say the facility in Clint isn't the only one holding kids in deplorable conditions after they were separated from family members. The bottom line, says Binford. Everybody just needs to sit down at a table and say, yes, for the few days that children are in U.S. custody, they should be washed, they should be clothed, they should be fed, they should be able to sleep in a bed, and we should work diligently to get them to their parents so that the American taxpayers are no longer having to pay for their care. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. So you just heard Kim mention the paralysis in the U.S. Congress on this issue. Well, late tonight, the U.S. House of Representatives just passed a $4.5 billion package to address the migrant surge. A development, but hardly a done deal. The bill has to survive the Republican Senate and a threatened veto from Donald Trump. We will return to the U.S.-Mexico border later in the show when Paul Hunter gets a rare ride along with the U.S. Border Patrol. But first, let's have a look now at the fears of another war in the Middle East. The good news 
is the U.S. and Iran are not hurling bombs at each other. The bad news, they are trading dangerous threats and insults. Iran called the White House desperate and confused. The U.S. president, never one to let a taunt go unanswered, is threatening Iran with obliteration. This looks like a total deterioration of diplomacy. But as Stephen D'Souza explains, Donald Trump has been here before. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani began the verbal volley, responding to the latest round of U.S. sanctions with a psychological assessment. They have become mentally disabled. The White House is suffering from mental disability. Following restrictions yesterday imposed on Iran's supreme leader, Rouhani said America has closed the door to diplomacy. They do strange things that no sane person in the history of world politics has done. Donald Trump fired back first on Twitter this morning, saying an attack by Iran would be met with great and overwhelming force. And in some areas, overwhelming will mean obliteration. The apocalyptic language is reminiscent of another Trump showdown. They will be met with fire and fury. Back in 2017, the world watched nervously as Trump called Kim Jong-un a rocket man on a suicide mission, and the North Korean dictator called him a mentally deranged dotard. Eventually, the two ended up at the negotiating table. Some U.S. officials seem to be pushing for the same result here. The president has held the door open to real negotiations. All that Iran needs to do is to walk through that open door. But the Iranians say the U.S. approach, all stick and no carrot, leaves them few options. What they have been calling for is total submission Iran to the demands of the United States. So now Iran is playing one of its most dangerous cards, saying it will ramp up its nuclear program and move past the limits imposed by the 2015 nuclear deal. The same deal Trump walked away from last year. Well, I'll tell you what the message is. When they're ready, they'll have to let us know. Speaking to reporters later this afternoon, Trump was less combative than his morning tweet. Whatever they want to do, I'm ready. Asked if he had an exit strategy in case all the bluster led to war. You're not going to need an exit strategy. <laughs> I don't need exit strategies. And so the war of words continues. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. A look at some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National, including a major development from Washington. Robert Mueller will finally answer questions about his Russia investigation publicly. He has agreed to testify before the House Judiciary and House Intel Committees on July 17th after they issued a subpoena for his testimony. This will be the first time he will answer questions about his 22-month investigation into Donald Trump. We are also following the terrible tale of a fertility doctor from Ottawa who had his license revoked for inseminating women with his own sperm. Today we heard from some of his children. I feel like I'm the evidence and the consequence, and I mean, obviously, physically, I look like Dr. Barwin, and so that kind of makes it real to people. Rebecca Dixon gave one of the emotional victim impact statements during a discipline committee hearing in Toronto. She discovered three years ago that Norman Barwin was her biological father. A class action lawsuit is being put together. It claims more than 50 children were conceived with the wrong sperm, including 11 with Barwins. Well, David St. Jacques is being reunited with his wife and kids tonight in Houston. And the Canadian Space Agency says he's doing well, even after that rough ride back from the International Space Station yesterday. Now, it happened late enough that in Canada, lots of folks may have missed it. So luckily, our own Chris Brown was right there when the capsule touched down in Kazakhstan. It's over there. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Oh. Woo! The giant chute appeared 10 kilometers up in the clear Kazakh sky, followed a few seconds later by a boom. The delayed sound of it deploying. Then a frenzied dash to jump into vehicles and head out over bumpy terrain to find the re-entry capsule. Charred black after being superheated coming into the atmosphere, the recovery crew worked to get each space traveler out one at a time. First the Russian commander Ole Kononenko, then American Anne McLean, who seemed positively pumped. How do you feel, Anne? Outstanding. Really? Ready to go again. David St. Jacques was the last to emerge and tried to force a smile, but his body was telling him otherwise. It's pretty standard to feel sick, as everything from your circulation system to your sense of balance is out of whack. 
after six months of weightlessness. Welcome back. After a stop at the medical tent, though, he found the strength to pause briefly to talk about what he was experiencing. Just fell back from the sky. Gravity is not my friend. <laughs> But the, you know what's striking me is the smell of grass, the smell of the wild grass here. It's just beautiful. The astronauts didn't linger on the ground. They were quickly on their way home, leaving the recovery crew to deal with the capsule. Well, it's incredible we can come right up and almost touch this, not that I'm going to, uh, but it really does look like it went right through a blast furnace. And have a look at these windows here. Just gives you an idea of just how much heat this was subjected to on re-entry. Given how much money Canada contributes to the International Space Station, flights for Canadian astronauts only come up every few years. And with new private American-built rockets emerging, the next time a Canadian flies, it may not be on a Soyuz. So, for Canada, a scene like this in the middle of the Kazakh steppes may not happen again anytime soon. Chris Brown, CBC News in central Kazakhstan. What a ride. So uh, as you can see, David St. Jacques felt pretty rough for a while there after landing. But beyond that, there is a long road to recovery. Vicodopia examines just what his body is likely to go through. Floating in near zero gravity is like aging in hyperspeed. But David St. Jacques and other astronauts only feel it when they return to Earth. I remember picking up the helmet of my spacesuit and wondering who put bricks in my helmet bag. Dave Williams has been there after returning from his mission to the space station. Without the resistance of gravity, blood pressure drops, muscles start to shrink and bone density decreases despite daily exercise. It gets a lot better after that. We go into a rehabilitation program and generally it can take one to one and a half times the length of the mission to get back into shape. So if you're in space for six months, it'll take six to nine months to get back to normal. There are other microcellular effects scientists are only starting to understand. When the U.S.'s Scott Kelly returned to Earth, they compared his chromosomes to his genetic twin and found they'd changed in unexpected ways. Saint-Jacques has been measuring his blood circulation as well as radiation levels from solar storms to see how it affects his arteries. Now that he's on the ground, this scientist will continue the tests this weekend. Going beyond the space station, the radiation effects are going to be dramatically increased. It's not just cancer we have to worry about, it's cardiovascular disease as well. As humans contemplate longer periods in space and exploration deeper into the galaxy, the limits of human endurance will face new challenges. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. So let's talk about how this country prepares for those new challenges and, and what the future has in store. Bob McDonald joins us now, host of CBC Radio's Quirks and Quarks. So Bob, What's next? I mean, you, you know, there are, there are new Canadian astronauts in the pipe. They're training. They're training for what exactly? Well, Andrew, uh, Jeremy Hansen is the next one in line to go up into space. He'll go up to the International Space Station. But Canada will continue to have a role in space in the future as we go back to the moon. Uh, we're going to provide another Canadarm, Canadarm 3, that will be part of a smaller space station that will be in orbit around the moon. And this new Canadarm will be used to grab spaceships that go from the Earth to the moon, also going down to the moon's surface, bringing in cargo vessels and all of that. And that means that Canadian astronauts will also have seats on rides to the moon in the in the distant future within the next decade or so so we will probably see Canadian boots on the moon so we'll be providing technology and we'll be providing astronauts and also what people don't talk about very much we'll also be providing science because Canada is also really good at building scientific instruments we have satellites like radar sat that just went up recently that looks down at the earth and we have scientific instruments that go to the other planets like Mars so we'll be involved in the space program like we always have with science with robotics and with astronauts so the journey continues <laughs> and, and very quickly i gotta ask you because right around the same time as the soyuz capsule was touching back down there was the the blast off and and touchdown of, of spacex's falcon heavy are, are you hopeful for for the private you know sector's involvement in all of this because there was that sort of spectacular crashed landing too right and as you can see on our screen it looks like our center core did not make it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, SpaceX is going to continue. I mean, sure, they have mishaps, but in the early days of the space program, there were mishaps as well. So we're going to see two parallel tracks. NASA's going to go back to the moon. So is SpaceX. And SpaceX is talking about going even further all the way to Mars. So it's going to be an interesting competition in the future.
Bob McDonald, always very good to talk to you. Thanks so much. Okay, Andrew. So interesting. <laughs> Still ahead on the national grounded planes with nowhere to go. Boeing scrambled to fix its 737 MAX fleet is causing a bit of gridlock. But first, when hate makes its way into pride. It's growing, it's menacing, it's making us feel unsafe, and something needs to be done about it. That's next. June is International Pride Month, and cities all around the world have been taking part. From Sydney to Seoul, Rome to Regina. People have donned the rainbow, raised those flags, and celebrated diversity, inclusion, and love. But at its core, pride remains a protest movement. LGBTQ people are still targets of bigotry and discrimination, including here in Canada. According to the most recent statistics, police reported hate crimes are on the rise. From 155 incidents in 2014, to 204 in 2017, a 32% increase over just three years. And now, video is emerging of a violent fight that took place inside Toronto's Eaton Centre this weekend, while outside, thousands were marching for equal rights at a Pride event. Katie Nicholson has the details. Happy Pride! Happy Pride! Just steps from this event celebrating love. A rage-filled skirmish shot and posted online by a man who calls himself a yellow vester. In it, far-right activists violently clash with an anti-fascist group. These demonstrators appear to land blows on a counter-protester on the ground, all while mall security try to intervene. Today, the Toronto Police Service confirms it is reviewing the video but says it was not a pride-related event or location. The executive director of Pride Toronto doesn't see it that way. No, I don't, because we had ample evidence leading up to it that something like this was going to happen. It's not a coincidence that there was a plan to disrupt Pride. In fact, Pride organizers were sent warnings from watch groups on social media about it. It's not the first Pride party these groups have tried to crash. Earlier this month, many of the same faces appeared disrupting this event in Hamilton. Anti-gay sentiment is nothing new, but how overtly it's being expressed, Olivia Nuama says, that is different. Our political environment, our social environment, and our economic environment is making it much more okay for people not only to post that they're going to create harm to innocent people, but then to come out and create that harm to innocent people. I wouldn't even call it a fight. Barbara Perry studies hate and extremism. She sees something else in this video evidence different groups are starting to work together. Now I think they're sort of cross-pollinating, uh, if you will, so that some of the more traditional sort of neo-Nazi groups that have long held uh, you know, homophobic uh, positions are also then influencing some of those more narrowly defined groups. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on The National, what one land transfer in Regina means for reconciliation. But first, we visit the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona to understand the challenges above and underground. We make sure our agents, especially in this station in Nogales, are trained to be in these pipes, to clear them and check them, so that way these people don't have free reign to crawl underground in an underground environment. You see the numbers are way, way down. Mexico has been really helping us a lot. That's Donald Trump today taking credit for tackling immigration. Under pressure from Trump, Mexico is deploying troops to both its northern and southern borders. And Trump has used controversial measures to fund the building of his border wall. Now, the physical wall that Trump promised remains, in many places, a fiction. The wall that does exist is a human one. The more than 45,000 agents of the U.S. Border Patrol and Paul Hunter got a rare look at their work. In the small Arizona border town of Nogales, finding the border is simple. Just look for the big brown fence and the razor wire. It cuts through the town, dividing the U.S. from Mexico. 
And in the years of Donald Trump, it's come to symbolize America's complicated approach to its immigration challenges. I got his wallet too. Equally easy to spot, evidence there's no easy solution, wall or no wall. This man, an alleged undocumented migrant, was caught and detained by U.S. Border Patrol agents just as we happened to be passing by. And he wouldn't be the only migrant detained by authorities on this day in Nogales. I would be amazed if we're not being watched right now. This is one of the things that we, we dealt with down here. These smugglers will sit on this hill and they will, like I said, guide people with cell phones. U.S. Border what Patrol agent doing? Jake Stukenberg has pretty much seen it all. He agreed to spend a day with CBC News to show us firsthand the problem that neither his fellow agents nor politicians nor that border wall seem able to solve. It is literally seconds from the time that someone jumps over that, that you know, comes over that fence right there puts their feet on American soil and runs up to these, these areas over here, this, this recycling center, the junkyard. There's a million hiding places in there. So it's literally 30 seconds before they could be in a hiding place and, and good luck finding them after that. The wall, or some version of it, has been in place in this part of America for years. The razor wire, courtesy the current U.S. president, is new. It was uncoiled here just a few months ago. It's as sharp as you might imagine and offers evidence it's been put to the test already. See that? They call them cuts, gaps in the razor wire cut by migrants. So this is one spot where they cut it. Obviously you can see they didn't cut this last strand down here, so, so that was effective. But if you go over here to the left, you'll see a large area. Holy cow, look at this. Yeah. With the right tools and some determination, it becomes a clear pathway over the top. Says Stukenberg, the wall slows down illegal crossers, but also underlines it doesn't stop them. And evidence of that is everywhere, from discarded water bottles dumped at the last moment to handprints left behind on the fencing itself. And even though there are cameras throughout the area, not to mention patrols from above, Fact is, illegal border crossings here happen almost all the time. Border agents in this district alone, we're told, catch and detain about a thousand undocumented migrants every week. You've seen the images of migrants fleeing strife in Central America, hoping for a better life on the other side of that wall. They typically seek out agents to claim asylum once inside the U.S. Their fate, then a complicated, politically charged challenge unto itself. Some of those who cross here are like that, but Border Patrol agents we met point to the drug trade and migrants making no claim for asylum as a key part of their challenge. I'm spotting a scout right now on the south side under a tree, two of them. Where? Straight. What do you see? See that valley? Halfway up, there's two people walking, three people. You see them? You can get out. Those are either smugglers or they're people being smuggled or, or possibly a smuggler in those being smuggled. They might be on to us now watching them. The three soon disappear into a gully. But almost immediately, agents nearby signal other suspected smugglers in a car chase across town. Zero to 60 in a second, right? racing across Nogales, readying to step in if needed. Sounds like potentially several undocumented individuals. And the vehicle started driving off. Agents got behind the vehicle. And uh, everybody called the bailout, right? bailed out of the vehicle. So it's running right now. Stukenberg tells us smugglers often show themselves at the wall to divert attention from others elsewhere, knowing there are only so many agents on patrol. They're obviously bailed out of the vehicle. It sounds like they're running into the desert. In this case, by the time we arrived, a suspected human smuggler was caught. Others with him still on the run out there somewhere as we drove by. We've got agents out there on foot. Sounds like there's a possible canine out there. Before the day's done, agents would catch and detain more than 150 suspected migrants in Stukenberg's area alone. And by the way, if you think the illegal crossings happen only over the border, consider what goes on underneath it. 
That's Kevin Hecht, who took us into a Border Patrol training tunnel, deep enough underground to get a sense of how dark and cramped smuggling tunnels can be. This one is meant to mimic a small drainage pipe smugglers often make use of. We make sure our agents, especially in this station in Nogales, are trained to be in these pipes, to clear them and check them, so that way these people don't have free reign to crawl underground in an underground environment. Smugglers, he says, will dig towards these tunnels, cut into them, and shimmy into America. This hand-dug tunnel was found in Nogales just a few weeks ago. It was videotaped and then destroyed by authorities. Tunnels of this size, we're told, are used mostly for drugs, these days typically fentanyl. The tunnels are too small for human smuggling. It's all belly crawl. Um, they're all very small. If we get one that we can crawl on our hands and knees on, it's a luxury. More of our stuff is pushing with your fingertips and your toes and are very tight. To underline that, heck, takes us further in, explaining what they look for, cuts and hidden passageways from those other tunnels dug by hand. So you have to go and look at the pipe and look for any change in the pipe. <clears throat> and then this will pop out, and behind it will be an illicit tunnel that you can crawl through to across the border. So that's where they call interconnecting. And then once you're in this pipe and you're on the U.S. side of the border, why dig when you have this? And then there's this place. Underneath downtown Nogales, a water drainage tunnel that crosses the border right underneath it. How far down there is Mexico? You're at the border. This is the border? Yes. The gate, now locked in place and on the U.S. side of the border, does its job. The smuggling and other crime that used to happen here has ended. Rapes, um, stabbings, drug smuggling, people smuggling, just you name it. It was a whole separate city on the ground. We haven't had any breaches or any attempts to breach in a long, long time, and I'm saying many years since we put these gates in. Back on top and further west, the wall, as it does in so many places along the border, just kind of ends leaving significantly less of a barrier. So this doesn't stop people from coming across, though, does it? No, oh, absolutely not. It's that hard. No, well, obviously we're still in the United States, but this is where our infrastructure ends. So from here on, for, for several miles, over those mountains and, and beyond, this is what barbed wire, this is what delineates the U.S. from Mexico. Stukenberg doesn't hide the fact that he's pro-wall. Policy, he says, is for politicians to set, but a wall, he says, at least slows down those who try to cross, if only briefly. We know that if you build a 100-foot wall, they're going to bring a 101-foot ladder. We know that, but that gives us a situational awareness that an incursion is happening, and if we see an incursion happening, then we have a very highly, very, very good chance that we will either deter those individuals back to Mexico or make an apprehension. Short answer, if you want a secure border, question for the country, build a wall. Give us the tools necessary to do our job. But even Trump supporters underline a wall unto itself isn't enough. This is one little herd that hangs out down here. Arizona rancher John Ladd calls the border wall a speed bump. He figures that over the years he's seen tens of thousands of migrants crossing into his property illegally. Even though at the south end of his ranch sits a wall with extra razor wire. Well, that's a doggy door fix right there where you're talking about people coming through. That's what we call them, doggy doors. Doggy doors. Doggy doors are cuts in a less fortified part of the fence made by migrants, sometimes small, sometimes not so small, some for people, some for drugs. Full-size trucks drove through here? Yeah, full of marijuana. The drug trade here has slowed in recent years, but, says Ladd, only when he convinced local authorities to help border agents push back against it. He tells us a Mexican cartel owns one of the ranches just on the other side of his. And even while drug smuggling has eased. But the people continue. The people continue. They're, I, I'd say right now they're catching 50 a week on us. Just on your land? Yeah. Ladd likes Trump's stand on the wall and immigration. Yes, it's all still unresolved, but Ladd blames that not on Trump, but on infighting among politicians broadly. I have zero confidence in Washington right now. Um, even the, there's probably 20 people back there that 
understand it. But that isn't enough. They're not supporting anything on the border. Indeed, the divide in this country on what to do about any of it runs deep. East of Nogales, at another one of those places where the wall just stops, amid the emptied water bottles and discarded clothing, some caught in the razor wire, bottles of fresh water, and as well, toothpaste and toothbrushes, all left for those in need. Jane Story comes by regularly to check that everything's in good supply. We come out in the desert and um, if we find an immigrant um, that needs help, we give them food, water, and give them medical care. Her um, specific concern that in chasing the bad guys, authorities go too hard on those simply seeking have. asylum. I hate this whole, I just, they're not drug dealer. I mean, yes, there could be, but these are desperate, desperate people who cannot make a living in their country. Which brings us back to the Border Patrol. Jake Stukenberg says he takes no joy in apprehending migrants, whatever led them here. And like so many in America, he has no perfect answer to the border's challenges. If I had the magic wand, very simple. I would eliminate the cartels. Eliminate the cartels from the face of the earth. What happens then? You get rid of the number one facilitator for narcotics into our country. You get rid of the number one facilitator for, for illegal immigration. You get rid of the number one facilitator of corruption in other countries. If I could do one thing to make this world a better place and getting rid of the immigration problem right here, it'd be get rid of the cartels. Until then, he says, he's just doing his job. And as night falls in Arizona, the seemingly unending patrols continue. Paul Hunter, CBC News, outside Nogales, Arizona. Now, there is another devastating picture of the crisis along the U.S. border that has emerged tonight, further east, near Brownsville, Texas. It is literally a picture, and one that we want to attach a warning to. It's a disturbing photo of death, but we think it's important to show. Now, it shows a Salvadoran father and his two-year-old daughter face down on the Mexican bank of the Rio Grande after they failed to cross into the U.S. Now, we have not independently confirmed the circumstances or their identities, but there are multiple reports tonight that they drowned on Sunday and their bodies were discovered yesterday. Now, government officials from El Salvador are warning others who are planning to migrate to the U.S. to reconsider for their own safety. Dozens of migrants have already died trying so far this year. We'll be right back. I'm Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Frontburner, what horse fatalities of the Santa Anita racetrack in California mean for the future of the entire industry and the Stronic family? You can subscribe to Frontburner wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, it's really, really uncomfortable right now. Um, the heat is really high. I think it's over 35. Heat records could be broken this week as Europe swelters through an early summer heat wave. France in particular is expecting highs of 45 degrees in some parts by Friday. Other countries from Spain to Switzerland could feel like 47 with the high humidity. The Hockey Hall of Fame is pleased to welcome Haley Wickenheiser as an honored member. And the Hockey Hall of Fame wasted no time inducting Haley Wickenheiser into its gallery. The four-time Olympic champ, retired in 2017, only became eligible for the Hall of Fame this year. It is hard to overstate her career, the all-time leading goal scorer on the Canadian women's hockey team. A property on the edge of Regina has a bleak history, but as of today, it certainly has a more secure future. It was once a cemetery for an indigenous residential school, and now, after years of effort, it's been saved. This is a place of deep human tragedy. 
Dozens of children are buried in unmarked graves at the site, but for decades, the land belonged to a private owner next to a plot owned by the RCMP. So they engineered a swap. And today, it was turned over to a preservation group ensuring the graves won't be disturbed or forgotten. Here's Bonnie Allen. RCMP property, no trespassing. That sign can be torn down, and the makeshift cemetery with unmarked graves of Indigenous children preserved with dignity. Debbie Hill brought her granddaughter to witness this land transfer from the RCMP. The RCMP have not a very good history, you know, in you know, in rounding up kids and putting them in residential school. My dad uh, being one of them, that he was always running away and being rounded up by the RCMP. For them to take this step, I think that's a very honourable and, and uh, wonderful step to take. Hill's grandparents went to the Regina Indian Industrial School in the early 1900s. She's part of a commemorative association that has fought for years to stop private development on this land. Sarah Longman drew inspiration from the residential school's most famous student. This is Kisik. The boys' before and after photos have become iconic images in Canada, emblematic of colonization and cultural abuse. We have a deep connection to our hair. And if you take a look at the first picture of Kisik, you see his hair with the long braids in there. And there's, there's a spiritual connection to our hair. And when you see the connection here and the hair gone, it, it's heartbreaking. It, it gives me goosebumps. Kisik died of tuberculosis after being sent home sick. Sonar technology has revealed at least 36 children are buried here with no grave markers. Uh, I look at what my son and how I would feel if he never came back from school. David John Owens is a Regina resident who has dedicated countless hours to the cemetery simply because he cares. We found um, bodies on top of bodies and it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's really horrifying to think of that. Now that the commemorative group owns this land, it can create a memorial to honour and recognise the children. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. The moment is next, but first. In case you missed it, this is what a mass aerospace recall looks like. Boeing is still scrambling to get its grounded 737 MAX planes back in the air months after two deadly crashes related to those faulty sensors. Boeing hopes to complete software fixes to the automated flight control system on every plane by year's end, but with some 500 planes in total, that's a big job, and there are currently so many at Boeing's Washington State factory right now, they are running out of space. So they had to get a little creative, moving them into the employee parking lot alongside workers' cars, making for a rather interesting juxtaposition of the daily commute. Boeing has had trouble getting the fix out quickly, but the industry remains hungry for this popular plane. Just last week during the Paris Air Show, the parent company of British Airways ordered 200 planes, all of which depends on Boeing meeting those deadlines. The Toronto Raptors president, Masai Ujiri, a man the city adores, gave a little love back to Toronto today and Canada as a whole for supporting the NBA champs. It was a heartfelt news conference. Ujiri spoke about what makes Canada exceptional and how that has allowed his team to thrive. And this is tonight's moment. It's such a, a big thing for our team, uh, our city, our country, um, to get to this moment. To be the only team outside the United States to win a championship, it inspires people all over the world. Um, I said that we'll win in Toronto and I really believed it. I said that when I got here and I truly believe it. It's always been about Toronto. Um, I, I love it here. Uh, my family loves it here. There's something about this team that reaches out to every person in this world. Yeah, there's, there's just something unique about it, whether you're talking about a kid from North Philly or a kid from Campton or a kid from Spain or Kinshasa. Man, this is... Canada here, you know, like what an opportunity, what a country. And I always tell some of my guys I talk to, you know, like it bothers me that we're not confident enough that we don't think we can do it. And there's so much opportunity here to do it even bigger. 
<laughs> and what a cheerleader for this nation. He was asked, by the way, you know, Masai, will you be taking the team presidency somewhere else? And he said, again, what a diplomat. I was flattered by that. But uh, he loves Toronto, and he knows that Toronto... Uh, loves him back, and that's what matters. Yeah, and you know, for all the rumors about you know whether he would leave or whether Kawhi Leonard would leave, you, you cannot discount the the allure of the challenge of repeating the feat, right? That's got to be a big draw. That's the national for this June 25th. Have a good night. Have a good night.